Hello everybody, Sapphire Saber here today with another Pokemon Nuzlocke. In this video, I will be attempting to complete a Nuzlocke in Pokemon Platinum with Hardcore Nuzlocke Rules. My rule set will include standard Nuzlocke rules such as, I can only catch the first Pokemon I encounter per route, if a Pokemon faints, it is considered dead and cannot be used anymore, and I also play with a dupes clause, so if I happen to find a duplicate Pokemon, so let's say I already have a Starly and I run into a Starly, I can re-roll that encounter until I get a new Pokemon that I have not caught before. As for rules that make this run hardcore, set mode must always be active. This will make it so that I can't ever get free switches without working for them, and it'll just make the game a little more difficult. I'm also not allowed to use any items in battle other than Pokeballs, and I'm also allowed to use held items. And I'm also not allowed to overlevel. My Pokemon's level will not be able to exceed the next gym leader's ace Pokemon. This will keep me from overleveling and make the game a little more interesting. With the rules out of the way, let's get started. I named my rival Poop because I have the humor of a toddler. Next, I almost witnessed the first death of the run with Poop attempting to run into the grass without a Pokemon. As a reward for our bravery, we are both gifted Pokemon. I end up choosing Chimchar, who will be named Chimichanga. Actually, Chimichanga didn't fit, so we'll go with Chimichaga and pretend it's correct. In most games, it's almost always best to pick the Fire-type starter in Nuzlocke, because Water-types are extremely common and there's a lot of them. Grass-types generally aren't very rare or honestly very useful, and in Sinnoh especially, there are very few Fire-types, so Chimchar is the obvious choice. Poop decides that now that we have Pokemon, we should battle. The first rival battle is always really easy though. You just attack the enemy until they faint. This surefire strategy is foolproof, as I wasn't worried even for a moment that I would lose. Yeah. Our Chimichanga unfortunately has a bold nature, which means less attack. Unfortunate, but Infernape is still really strong regardless. Next up, it's time to catch some Pokemon. I catch a Starly and name it Rotisserie, and a Bidoof that I name Bread. After Chimichanga, I kind of felt like a food theme might be fun. I will most certainly not run out of names by the end of this run, no way. After that, I encounter a Shinx, which is pretty exciting. Shinx isn't the best of Pokemon, but this one has Intimidate, which makes it invaluable. Electric type is also a good type to have for coverage, so I'm very excited to use it. To help Chimichanga with our water type weaknesses, never mind then. Shinx ends up knocking out our Chimichanga, and I just decide to restart the run. I've only been playing for 10 minutes, and this run is obviously winnable without Chimichanga, but to lose him this early is just a stupid mistake, so we're just going to go on to attempt number 2. This attempt goes very similarly with our Chimichanga getting a sassy nature this time, which means we're going to be a little slower, but hey, at least our attack isn't going to be lowered, I guess. You might also notice that the Pokemon names are lowercase instead of being all uppercase like normal. I use the Universal Pokemon Randomizer to lowercase the names and make all trade evolutions possible. This means I can use Pokemon like Golem or Scizor, even though I can't actually trade to evolve them. Trade evolutions now evolve at either level 37, or while leveling up holding their respective item. So for example, Scyther evolves into Scizor, while leveling up holding a Metal Coat. Pretty simple. If you're not sure how to do this, I actually have a guide on how to use the Pokemon Randomizer, and I will leave that in the description for you guys. This time, I catch Shinx without casualty as well. No Intimidate for this one, but nonetheless, Porkchop is added to the team. Or actually not, I wasn't paying attention and got crit while grinding him. Yikes. This just goes to show how important it is both to never get distracted and always consider critical hits while playing Nuzlocke. This is a lesson that I'll never fully learn, as you'll come to see. Next to Jubal Life, I grab the old rod so I can fish up a Magikarp in Sand Gem City. I name him Salmon and decide to protect him until he can evolve. Gyarados is one of, if not the best Pokemon to get in Nuzlocke, so I definitely want to keep this thing safe. I also catch a Budu and name him Salad. Salad will be very useful for the upcoming Rock Gym. I then catch a Zubat named Soup. Crobat is also an incredibly strong common Pokemon for Nuzlocke, and as you'll see, Crobat can carry some battles. Just outside of Jubilife, I have to battle Poop, but seeing as his AI is programmed to not use Bubble, his Water-type move, I easily defeat him. My next encounter was an Abra, but after instantly breaking out of my Premier Ball, that's a failed encounter. Gotta love Teleport. I also catch a Psyduck named Turducken. She'll be useful for the upcoming Rock Gym as well, so now I've got a lot of good coverage for that. I catch a Geodude named Crackers, and she happens to have an adamant nature, so more attack and less special attack. Absolutely perfect for her. She'll make an excellent golem if she survives that long. My last encounter before Rourke is a Bonita who I named Salsa. Now, I decide to do some grinding. Even though I have the proper types to handle this gym with ease, Granados can do a lot of damage with Headbutt, so I, I wanted to be extra careful. 
To be totally optimal, I decide to evolve Salad before the first gym. Friendship evolutions are terrible, just horrible. At this stage in the game, in order to not break level cap, my only option is to run 40,000 steps to get the happiness necessary to evolve Salad. Was all of this necessary? Of course not, but I was excited to use Salad on my team and figured, hey, it wouldn't hurt to get out of the way. I put Soup in the party as well while running around so that he'll have max friendship and I can have a crowbat as soon as he evolves. After grinding, I challenged Rourke. I lead with Rotisserie to intimidate the Geodude and swap to Salad. My plan is to stun Spore, then use Growth a few times and sweep the entire gym with Mega Drain. This plan couldn't possibly go wrong. Salad just has to not miss three stun spores in a row and not get crit by a rock throw when I forgot to account for Intimidate. For those who don't know, when a Pokemon lands a critical hit, it ignores any negative stat changes. So when deciding that Salad could probably survive another crit, I forgot to account for the extra damage it, the Geodude would get from ignoring the attack drop. So Salad dies after I spent 45 minutes running back and forth just to evolve it. Joy. As it turns out, I didn't even need to use this elaborate setup with Salad. All I needed to use was Turducken to spam Water Gun, and then have Crackers tank some hits so Chimichanga could finish off Kranidos. An unfortunate outcome, but it was my own mistake. Roserade isn't even that amazing anyways, so it, I guess it isn't a huge loss. I'm still pretty upset about that misplay though. However, the show must go on, so I begin heading towards the next gym. I catch Shellos named Cucumber, but I won't be using her yet. She doesn't get strong until she evolves, so for now she'll warm the bench. I also encounter a Combi, but it's male and can't evolve, so I decided to run away. Male Combi is absolutely useless other than being death fodder, so I really didn't want it. The next notable battle is with Commander Mars. Her Peregli is very fast and very strong for this point in the game, and can be pretty hard to deal with if you come unprepared. Fortunately, I have some excellent counters in the form of Crackers and Chimichanga. I have Turducken handle her Zubat, and Perugly comes in. I switch into Rotisserie for the Intimidate and take a fake out. I decide that I'm probably safe to attack once, so I use Growl to lower the attack even more. After getting hit, I'm most certainly dead to a crit, so I swap to Crackers. Crackers can tank Perugly's physical hits very well, so I take the opportunity to fire off a few attacks, before getting a little too injured to keep fighting. Expecting another faint attack, I can swap to Chimichanga and Mach Punch safely to finish Perugly. Easy. On the way to Eterna City, I catch a Pachirisu and name him Taco. I also catch a Silcoon and name her Butter. She's level 12 and won't learn Observe when she evolves like normal, because she only learns it at level 10, so I decide she isn't worth using. She'll join Cucumber on the bench. While traversing the forest, I severely misjudged my safety. Turducken was hit by both of these Abra's hidden powers and one of them crit, killing Turducken. I didn't even consider this and thought I was totally safe. Oh well, Turducken put in work on the first gym and he'll be remembered. I take the opportunity to do some grinding in the forest, since Cheryl? Cheryl? I don't really know. Will heal my Pokemon for me after every battle, it saves a lot of grinding time from having to head back to the Pokemon Center. Before the grass gym, I can get two more encounters. I catch a Metatite named Tofu and a Bronzor I named Plate. I couldn't think of a food to name a Bronze Mirror slash Bell Pokemon, so I decided I needed a plate for all this food. A little uncreative, but it fits. Now it's time for the gym, but with Staravia, Golbat, and Monferno, I'm not even a little bit worried. I also level up Plate a little bit, since Steel Typing will be super useful in walling the Grass and Poison type Pokemon. Gardenia leads with a Turtwig, so I have Rotisserie handle it. I almost take it down with Wing Attack, but it gets to set up a Reflect. Expecting her to heal, I swap to Chimichanga, since she has Ember, which is a special move, bypassing the Reflect. Next up is Cherim, but an Ember and a Flame Wheel, once Reflect ends, is enough to take her down but Chimichanga gets hit by Leech Seed. I decide it's safest to swap out and remove the Leech Seed, so I send in Soup. Soup is easily able to tank Grass-type moves, since he resists them with both of his types, and easily finishes Rose Raid with two wing attacks. Another easy badge, and with no pointless death this time. Perfect. After the gym, I level up Soup right away so that he can evolve into Crobat, giving him a really nice power increase. The next notable fight is going to be against Commander Jupiter, and although she isn't as difficult as Mars, she is pretty threatening. The difference is that Mars' Perugly could wipe your entire team if you aren't careful, whereas Jupiter's Skun Tank may take out one or two of your Pokémon if you aren't careful. Nonetheless, it doesn't hurt to be prepared. Jupiter leads with her Zubat, but Plate is able to easily defeat it. Resisting most of its moves and being extremely tanky while having Psychic moves to fire back with makes Zubat a breeze. Next up is her Skun Tank. I decide that Plate can probably survive one hit and went for Confuse Ray. 
Looking back, Plate was definitely dead to a crit there, but I got lucky and wasn't punished. I sent in Rotisserie to use Intimidate and to drop Skuntank's attack. It hurt itself, giving me a nice easy switch into Crackers. But then Skuntank uses Screech, so I decided to switch back to Rotisserie to get rid of the defense drop and get another Intimidate. This time I switched for Chimichanga, expecting a Night Slash, but it just went for Poison Gas? I have Chimichanga use Taunt to prevent Poison Gas and Screech, and I know Chimichanga can easily tank Night Slashes, so all it takes is a few Flame Wheels to bring her down. With a little planning and smart play, Jupiter isn't too bad. I get a few more encounters on the way to Heart Home City, namely Scrambles the Togepi from Cynthia, Dino Nugget the Kranidos from Mining, Spoon the Ralts, and Pasta the Eevee. Pasta was the name I went for Eevee because, I don't know, pasta can be a lot of different things. I, I, I'm starting to run out of names at this point if you can't tell, and we're not even halfway through the run. I'm sure this will go well. I end up playing pretty horribly and missed two encounters on the way. I accidentally ran from a chop I found just by going too fast, and the gibble I encountered in the cave used Dragon Rage too many times, leaving me in a situation where I either had to chance it and throw a ball, risking it not catching and killing a Pokemon, or running away and giving up on it. I decide it's probably best just to run, but losing out on a potential Garchomp is heartbreaking. Nonetheless, it's time to prepare for Fantina's Ghost Gym. There aren't many good counters I can get for this gym. The only option I have to get a Dark type is Umbreon, but I wouldn't have any Dark moves to follow the level cap of 26, so that's out the window. I could go catch a Ghastly in the old Chateau if I had remembered it existed during the run, but I completely skipped it. Whoops. I know Soup can use Bite on her Ghost for a lot of damage, but her Miss Maggie is a Psybeam, which could one-shot Soup if it crit. Seeing no better option, I decide to go in with the team I had, fully expecting to lose some Pokemon here. If it comes down to it, Bread and Plate won't be in-game superstars, and I'm willing to lose them if need be. I led with Crackers on Duskull, since I don't want Soup getting burned. Crackers isn't useful against Miss Magius due to the magical leaf that she knows, so I might as well preserve Soup as long as I can. Crackers is able to Rock Blast Duskull down while only taking a small amount of Future Sight damage, and out comes Miss Magius. This became a battle of attrition. I had no clean switch, so I kind of panicked a little. I know Ms. Magius will use Magical Leaf, but if I send in Soup, and then Soup gets crit on the side beam after that, Soup dies. I need to chip Ms. Magius down a little bit before sending Soup in. I try to pivot around Plate and Rotisserie to stall some PP, and then I totally forget to count the PP that she uses, so this didn't accomplish anything. Luckily, these two can pivot extremely well, since Ms. Magius likes to go for Shadow Ball against Bronzor, and goes for side beam against Rotisserie. I managed to chip Miss Magius a little bit while using Wing Attack on Rotisserie when he wasn't confused, but eventually Rotisserie was too injured to keep swapping. I swap in Bread to absorb the Shadow Balls, but Plate starts to get too injured to take any more hits. Miss Magius isn't as low as I need her to be for Soup to bite safely, but I don't see a better option, so predicting a Magical Leaf, I send in Soup. Soup just has to dodge a critical hit or cause Miss Magius to flinch with his next bite. Through a stroke of luck, Miss Magius flinched! Soup was then able to easily finish off Miss Magius with another bite, and since he was still basically full health, he was able to bite down the Haunter with ease as well. That's badge number 3, and somehow I had no deaths during that battle. Back to getting new encounters before Maylene's fighting gym. I catch a Chansey named Peach, a Scyther named Celery, a Kadabra named Lemon, which I was super excited for since it could eventually evolve into Alakazam, an insanely powerful Pokemon, and a Duskull named Grape. I had a lot of strong Pokemon for the upcoming fighting gym, namely Lemon, Rotisserie, and Chibichanga. I went in confidently, which just never goes poorly in Nuzlocke's ever. I led with Lemon, deciding that if I wanted to utilize him in this fight, he should probably come out first since he can't really switch in well. I go for a reflect, thinking that I'm safe, and then die to a critical rock doom. I did the calculations, that Meditite had to have had an attack boosting nature, and to get a high roll for that critical hit to kill. Unfortunate, but I guess it's a misplay. I send in Rotisserie, who easily defeats Metatite and Machoke, and out comes her Lucario. Lucario is extremely powerful at this point in the game, so I need to be careful. Chimichanga could easily handle it, but won't be able to switch in safely. Expecting a Force Palm, I switch into Soup to confuse the Lucario. Realizing I'm dead to a Crypt Metal Claw, I switch in Plate for Lucario, and it hurt itself in confusion. I decide to try to put it to sleep, but I miss, and I'm dead to a crit, so I can't stay in another turn. It seems my best play now is to pivot into Soup to absorb the fighting attack and hope Shell Bell heals me enough to survive Crit Metal Claw. I definitely would have died to a crit, but once again I luck out. I rest the crit and attack once more, and luckily I survive, but Lucario got the attack boost. If she decides to heal it, I'm in trouble. Luckily, she doesn't heal and Soup is able to defeat Lucario. 
This was a really sloppy fight, and any stray extra critical hits would have killed Soup, but I wasn't punished, so let's move on. Time for yet another batch of encounters before Crasher Wake. I get a gift Porygon and name it Apple, you know, since it's a computer. I also get a Rhyhorn named Hot Dog, a Hippopotas named Toast, a Houndor named Pepperoni, and a Weasel named Tangerine. Now on to preparing for Wake. Wake's team isn't necessarily threatening, but after the last gym, I just want to be careful. Wake leads with a Gyarados, and I don't really have any electric types to handle it. I figure it's a good use of Eevee, so I evolve Pasta into Jolteon and Cheech Thunderbolt in preparation for Wake. However, Wake's Quagsire poses a threat to Pasta, and I don't have any grass type moves for it. I devise an absolutely foolproof plan to use Natural Gift on Pasta, letting him hold a Pineapple Berry, making Natural Gift a 70 power grass move. There's absolutely zero chance this does not one shot Quagsire, so I confidently enter the fight. Wake leads Gyarados, but Pasta's Thunderbolt is able to swiftly knock it out, and as expected, Wake sends in Quagsire. Time for my brilliant plan to be put into motion. I click Natural Gift and... wait, why did that do so little? So as it turns out, Natural Gift is physical. I had it in my head that the move was special and didn't even bother to check. I am incredibly stupid sometimes. It's alright though, a critical mud shot wouldn't even have killed Pasta, so Pasta survives. I switch in Tangerine, the new Floatzel, to tank a mud shot and finish off Quagsire with two crunches. Lastly, Wake's own Floatzel comes in. Pasta can, de can defeat this thing in one hit, but I need to safely get Pasta on the field. I switch into Rotisserie to lower its attack with Intimidate, and then expecting Ice Fang decides to switch into Salmon, the new Gyarados, for another Intimidate. I take very little damage and decide to just fight with Salmon. Using Dragon Rage and Bite, Salmon is able to get Floatzel to about a third HP before being in range to die from a crit. Predicting another crunch, I send a plate in. I attempt to put him to sleep, but I miss. I think I'll live a crit brine though, so I go for another Hypnosis, this time landing the hit. I switch in Pasta safely to Thunderbolt the Sleeping Floatzel, earning me my fifth badge with no casualties this time. Word of the wise, double check if a move is special or not, even if you think it is. If Quagsire had Earthquake there and not Mudshot, I could have been in serious danger. Our next gym battle will be in Canalev City against Byron, the Steel Gym Leader, and also Rourke's father. Byron is pretty weak though, like father like son, being so late in the game with only three Pokemon that are incredibly easy to wall with a ground, fire, or fighting type. So I'm not too worried. On the way, I get a handful of new encounters, including a Pichu named Corn, a Meryl named Donut, a Tentacool named Jelly, a Mr. Mime named Lollipop, an Onyx named Rocky Road, and a Riolu Egg from Riley that I named Blueberry. I'm getting dangerously close to the level cap, so in an effort to not overlevel an impo important Pokemon for Byron, I use Plate throughout Iron Island. This is a really dumb idea in hindsight, as you'll see in a moment. I'm too slow to run away from encounters, so my solution is to just switch in Rotisserie, then run away. This quite literally blows up in my face, as a wild Graveler grits a self-destruct, ending Rotisserie's life. This really sucks, but it isn't the end of the world. Staraptor wouldn't be a Pokemon I'd bring to the Elite Four anyways, and as much as the loss is painful, it's something I can handle. However, looking back, I did have a smoke ball in my bag at the time. If I had just given that to Plate, I could have avoided this entire situation. Oh well, nothing to be done but keep moving and challenge Byron. Byron leads with Magneton, so I lead with Chimichanga. One close combat is all it takes to defeat Magneton, and out comes Steelix. Even though it's super effective, close combat actually won't one-shot here because of how defensive Steelix is. So just to be safe, I switch in Salmon on the Earthquake, since he's immune, and then switch to Tangerine on the Ice Fang. Since Surf is special, and Steelix doesn't have a lot of special defense, it easily goes down to one hit. Last up is Bastiodon. Bastiodon isn't threatening power-wise, but Metal Burst is pretty scary. It can reflect one and a half times the amount of damage dealt to it, so I need to one-shot it to be safe. Expecting it to use Stone Edge, I switch to Crackers, who is able to take the hit and fire back with a four times effective Earthquake that cleanly one-shots Bastiodon. Badge number six is mine, and my team is looking strong. Next on the agenda is blasting through some Team Galactic things, including a few commander fights, but they're incredibly easy, so I'm going to skip over them. Next up, I head towards Snowpoint City, capturing Fork the Sneasel, Icing the Snover, and Bacon the Swinub. On the way, I accidentally bump into the trainer with the Ambipom. This Pokemon isn't that threatening, or so I thought. Turns out it has Technician, an ability to power up weaker moves, along with Double Hit. The combination of Normal Type Stab, two hits, and Technician, along with the chip damage from Hail, resulted in me almost losing Chimichanga. If one of those hits had crit, Chimichanga would have died. What of the wise, it void this trainer like the plague. Now, on to Candace preparations. 
While grinding, I carelessly leveled Chimichanga past level 44, the current level cap. This means Chimichanga is unusable in this battle, which is really unfortunate, as he definitely could have soloed this entire gym. It can't be helped though, so I raised some new team members like Blueberry and Celery uh, to prepare as best I can. My team is still really solid for this battle, so I think I'll be able to pull through. Candice leads with Sneasel, and I lead with Blueberry. One Aura Sphere defeats Sneasel after it does a small amount of damage. Next is Piloswine, but close combat one-shots it before it can attack. Out comes Abomasnow, and a Hailstorm is brought with it. Blueberry's close combat can't be stopped, however, one-shotting Abomasnow as well. This leaves Candace with only Frostlass, who is very terrifying in the hail. Its Snow Cloak ability makes her more evasive, and she has double teamed to dodge even more, and her blizzards can't miss in the hail. I swap to Celery, and she uses double team, further increasing her evasiveness. Through a stroke of luck, Celery managed to land a bullet punch, knocking her out with a single critical hit. I definitely feel good about leveling up Celery now, he and Blueberry both clutched this fight out for me. That's 7 badges down, and one more to go. Before I can get the 8 badge though, I have to battle Cyrus in the Distortion World, arguably the second most terrifying fight in this run. Here's his team. He has a lot of really powerful Pokemon with diverse movesets, making him tough to handle. I've lost a run in the past to him, so I, I want to take this really seriously. Although my rule set doesn't place a level cap for Cyrus, I decide to stay at level 48 to match his highest level just to make the fight a little more interesting. I carefully plan my team to be able to counter his entire team, and terrified, enter the battle. Cyrus leads with Houndoom, and I lead with Chimichanga. Close combat's able to one-shot him, but Gyarados comes out, a very terrifying Pokemon. I know Pasta can outspeed and one-shot it, but this Gyarados knows Earthquake. This is a moment when you can see how set mode makes things more difficult, because on switch mode I could have just freely swapped to Pasta, and this fight would have been a breeze. Regardless, expecting him to use Waterfall, I send in Salmon to intimidate and absorb the hit. Now, expecting an Ice Fang, I'm able to safely switch in Pasta. This is what we in the biz call a pivot. You've seen me do this a little bit before. Using Salmon as a pivot to bring in Pasta was incredibly safe, since this game's AI was fairly predictable. I knew Gyarados would see the kill on Chimichanga and go for Waterfall, so Salmon took the hit. And then while Salmon is out, Gyarados will never use Earthquake against Salmon since he's part Flying type, so I can safely switch in Pasta. Using tricks like this is an easy way to get better at Nuzlocking. After Gyarados, Cyrus sends in Weavile. I swap to Chimichanga, who easily tanks a few hits and defeats Weavile with close combat, and out comes Crobat. Microwave totally walls Crobat, as Crobat has poison and flying moves. Microwave finishes Crobat, and last is Honchkrow. I can't keep Microwave in, as this bird has Heat Wave, and Microwave's special defense isn't so good. I switch in Salmon to absorb the Heat Wave, and then get burned. Unfortunate. Knowing this thing will likely use Drill Peck, I switch to Crackers. Crackers can survive one critical Psychic, so I decide to use Rock Blast hoping for the win. Three hits is all it takes to bring down Honchkrow, leaving Cyrus defeated. Although that battle is tricky, with Popper planning, it is definitely manageable. We're not done with the Distortion World yet though. I still have to deal with Garatina. I could catch it or run away, but I figured it'd be more fun to defeat it, since catching it just to box it is a bit of a gray area on Nuzlocke's. Luckily for me, Microwave resists all of his moves, so I just have to Thunderbolt a few times to finish it off. I was never in any danger. The last gym leader is Faulkner, the electric leader. For an 8th gym leader, he's pretty pathetic. A ground type can solo most of this gym, so I'm not worried. On the way I get one more encounter, a Wingle named Duck. Yes, she is definitely a duck. On the way to Sunny Shore City, I made arguably the dumbest mistake of this entire run. Dumber than losing Salad. All honesty. While battling optional trainers, there's my first mistake, my Pokemon got a little beat up. A smart player would go back and heal, but I was feeling overconfident after Cyrus and overestimated Salmon's bulk. I switched in against a Gyarados that had set up rain, and a critical rain boosted Aqua Tail finished off Salmon. This sucks. Salmon was definitely my MVP, and to lose him to a random trainer is just a shame. A smart player would have realized that they're not in the best mindset to make decisions and just take a break, but I decided to power through. Not long after, I got Celery Magnet Pole trapped against a Magneton he couldn't handle. Its Thunderbolt dealt way too much damage and Celery fell as well. Two deaths before I even get to Volkner. Fantastic! As much as this sucks, the run goes on. I still have plenty of strong Pokemon to use, so I begin grinding. Yay. Cucumber the Shallows finally gets off the bench, as I decide having a ground type that isn't weak to Focus Blast is pretty valuable. I also train Grape the Duskull so I can have something to be immune to that Focus Blast, 
probably overkill, but you can't be too careful with hardcore Nuzlocke, no matter how painful the grinding is. After grinding, I challenge Faulkner. He leads Jolteon and I lead Crackers. Jolteon has Iron Tail, but it can't do much damage, so a single Earthquake takes care of it. Raichu comes in, and knowing it has Focus Blast, I switch to Grape to absorb the hit. A critical Shadow Punch finishes Raichu, and Luxray comes out. Fearing Crunch, I send in Microwave as a pivot. Then, predicting the Fire Fang, Cucumber comes in. Two Mud Bombs finish Luxray, and lastly is Electivire. In a decision I don't really understand, I switch to Grape. In hindsight, Crackers totally walls this thing, but I think I wanted to burn it? It was really dumb, as a crit would have killed Grape here, but I'm not punished, so I guess that's okay. I think after losing Salmon and Celery, I just wanted to be super careful with Cracker's life, but in turn I risked Grape, so it really wasn't the best play. After that, I send in Crackers, who easily finishes Electivire with an Earthquake, earning me the 8th and final Gym Badge. There are two more encounters I can get before the Pokemon League, namely Fanta the Mantike, Manta Ray, Fanta Ray, see what I did there, huh? I also catch the Pokemon I decide fit enough to be dubbed our fork, like a bite. It unfortunately has a modest nature, so more special attack and less attack. Regardless, Garchomp may just be the saving grace I need to handle the Elite Four. I begin preparing for the Elite Four, as this game's champion is no joke. You absolutely need to plan for Cynthia's Garchomp, or you will lose. This thing is an absolute monster, and it can end your entire run if you slip up at any moment. I decide that Mamoswine with Ice Shard is a pretty safe bet, since Ice Shard always goes first, and it can almost one-shot Garchomp, so if I could only weaken it a little bit first, I could send in Mamoswine and just finish it off for free. This plan doesn't end up working because I made a very crucial error. While grinding, of course, I went to return to the Pokemon Center to heal and restore my PP, but accidentally run too far and trigger the rival fight with only four usable Pokemon, one of which having close to zero PP. I was basically running with Chimichanga, Microwave, Crackers, and an underleveled fork, since Floatzel had two surfs left. Bacon was too low to do anything, and Tangerine, well, didn't have any moves. This was such a dumb mistake. Through careful play, however, I'm able to pull through the fight, but at the cost of Bacon's life. Nothing I had could take Heracross's close combat, so I had to sacrifice Bacon to get a clean switch to Chimichanga. This hurt, as Bacon was my plan for Carchomp, but I needed everyone else on my team. This really sucks, but luckily I still have Knife the Sneasel, who can hit hard with Ice Shard also. Weavile will be tougher to switch in against Garchomp, but I'll have to make it work. I begin the long and tedious grind, also making an effort to at least mostly EV train Fork and Knife, so they both have a lot of speed and attack, making them both incredibly strong. I also somehow managed to get Pokeross on one of my Pokemon, which is rarer than finding a Shiny. I didn't even notice until after grinding, but still, neat. My final team is assembled, and honestly, I feel pretty good about them. I could probably replace Crackers with Rhyperior, but I'm attached enough to Crackers that I want her to finish the run with me. After buying some healing items to use outside of battle, I enter the Pokemon League. First up is Aaron, the Bug Trainer. He leads you on Mega, and knowing it can't hurt Crackers, I take the turn to set up a Stealth Rock. This will damage Aaron's bugs quite a bit on entry. Yanmega tried to dodge by setting up a few double teams, but Crackers lands a rock slide to knock it out. Aaron sends in Scizor, so I swap to Chimichanga to safely one-shot it with Flamethrower. Drapion is next, but Microwave is able to counter it, finishing it off with a single Thunderbolt. Next is Heracross, so I send in Fork, who took the close combat. Heracross's defense fell after using close combat, so a single Dragon Claw finished it off. I did the calculations, without Stealth Rock, this actually wasn't a guaranteed knockout, so I'm very glad I set that up. Vespaquen comes out, but after losing half of its HP to Stealth Rock, I'm able to switch in Microwave and Thunderbolt it down. That's the first Elite Four down, with no casualties. Next up is Bertha, the Ground Trainer. Unfortunately for her, I have a Water-type, invalidating most of her team. I use Fork to handle Whiskash, and Glyscore comes in, threatening Fork with Ice Fang. I'm able to switch to Knife, who can Ice Punch Glyscore for a one-shot, and when Golem comes in, I just switch to Tangerine. Tangerine's Surf can take out both Golem and Rhyperior, leaving just him out on, who Fork can defeat with no issue. Two down, two to go. The next member is Flint, who specializes in Fire types. With the most cleverly crafted plan for a battle this run, I challenge Flint. Somehow I managed to scrape by unharmed. 
Lastly, there's Lucian, the Psychic type member. Knife uses Night Slash to one-shot Mr. Mime, but Lucian responds with Gallate. I have no resist to the Drain Punch, so I send in Fork, who is surprisingly bulky. Garchomp is pretty overpowered, and in all honesty, I probably will ban it in future runs. It did most of the work for this Elite Four. Regardless, it Earthquakes Gallade down without taking too much damage. Alakazam is next, but expecting a Psychic, I freely switch to Knife, who can outspeed and one-shot with Night Slash. Easy. Lucian switches to Bronzong, who Knife can't one-shot, so I need to switch. Problem is, none of my Pokémon can one-shot it. Chimichanga's Flare Blitz can with a high roll, but it isn't guaranteed, so I need to weaken it before I can bring in Chimichanga so it doesn't kill me. I swap to Tangerine as Bronzong uses Calm Mind, which is actually really scary. Tangerine uses Crunch to chip down Bronzong and takes a huge Psychic that definitely would have killed it for a crit. It was pretty risky, but I weighed Tangerine's life against Chimichanga and made my decision. I then use Knife as a pivot to absorb Psychic and then force Bronzong to use Gyro Ball to safely switch in Chimichanga. After being weakened, Flare Blitz is a guaranteed knockout, and lastly Espeon comes out. This is basically a weaker Alakazam, so I switch Knife in again to absorb another Psychic and finish it off with a Night Slash. The Elite Four is done and I can challenge Cynthia with all six of my Pokémon. If I'm careful, this is definitely a run I could win. I'll likely lose a few Pokémon, but against a champion in a Nuzlocke, that's totally fine. When a Pokémon is no longer useful against the champion's team, they're effectively not useful for the rest of the run, so even if it's unfortunate, it's optimal to sacrifice them if necessary. I'd like to have everyone make it to the finish line, but getting to that finish line is my top priority. With that in mind, let's finish this run. Cynthia leads a Spiritomb, so I use Microwave to tank a Shadow Ball and finish it off with two Thunderbolts. Angrily, she decides she wants to end me right now and sends in the Dreadful Garchomp. It's likely going for Earthquake here, but Knife can't take a hit from Garchomp. I need to sacrifice someone to pull this off. I ultimately decide Tangerine is the least useful, since I mainly brought it for Bertha. With a heavy heart, I switch to Tangerine. Through a stroke of luck, Garchomp goes for Flamethrower. Although Earthquake is 4 times effective on Microwave, Magnezone has significantly lower special defense than regular defense, so I guess Garchomp must have some more damage there? This works in my favor though, as Tangerine lives. I still have to sacrifice him, so I click Ice Beam, deciding that hey, if I manage to hit first, I can deal some damage. Somehow, and I cannot stress enough how I have no idea how, Tangerine outspeeds Garchomp, nearly one-shots it, and then survives the following Earthquake with 26 HP. Tangerine apparently did not want to die here, and finished off Garchomp with a second Ice Beam. I underestimated you, Tangerine, but that was amazing. Knife is still at full health in case I need it later, and Tangerine lives. Rose Raid comes in, but I decide after his feats, Tangerine deserves to live. I swap to Microwave, who's able to paralyze and damage Rose Raid before getting extremely low. I swap to Chimichanga, who can finish Rose Raid with a Flare Blitz. Three Pokemon down, and I still have all six. Things are looking good. And then Cynthia sends in my Lodic, and I had to make a tough decision. I could sack Tangerine for a safe switch to Microwave, but there's no guarantee Microwave can even outspeed. Cynthia has my Lodic, Lucario, and Togekiss left. Chimichanga does really not anything to any of these Pokemon well, and, well, isn't worth protecting. Chimichanga fires off one more close combat to weaken my Lodic, and falls to the following surf. Rest easy, Chimichanga. You are with us from the beginning, and I'm gonna make your sacrifice not in vain. Microwave has a relatively good chance to outspeed my Lodic, and it's dead weight against the rest of Cynthia's team, so I take a risk and try for Thunderbolt. My Lodic outspeeds and finishes Microwave with a surf, though, leaving me in a tricky situation. I send in Knife, who is able to finish the damage by Lodic with a Night Slash, and now comes with Gario. Fork can handle this, but I need a clean switch. Tangerine being so injured is the obvious choice, so after being an absolute trooper against Garchomp, Tangerine falls so Fork can safely switch in. A single Earthquake finishes Lucario, and now there's just Togekiss. Knife can't one-shot here, and Togekiss is Aura Sphere, so I need to weaken Togekiss before I send in Knife. I decide Fork will either finish Togekiss or go down swinging. And after a Draco Meteor and a Dragon Claw, Fork takes a critical air slash that tanks him down. Finally, I send in Knife, who defeats Togekiss with a few Ice Punches. And with that, that's Pokemon Nuzlocke beaten with hardcore Nuzlocke rules. This run was incredibly fun and challenging, with it being my first real hardcore Nuzlocke. I know it technically took me two attempts, but the first attempt was literally 10 minutes, so it's basically my first try. Nonetheless, I'm proud of myself for this run. 
I made a lot of dumb mistakes, and I didn't always play optimally, but for the most part I think I played well. It was very rewarding when my carefully planned strategies paid off, like against Cyrus or Cynthia. I really hope you enjoyed watching this video, as it took quite some time to put together. I usually do Let's Play style content on this channel, but I decided to try something new, so if you like the style of content, or you want me to go back to Let's Plays, let me know down in the comments. And if you want to see more content like this, subscribe and ring the bell so you'll be notified next time I upload. That's all I've got, so I hope you enjoyed, and I hope to see you in the next one. Goodbye!